Well, as you know, all this crazy YouTube stuff has brought plenty of interesting things into my life. Over the last couple of weeks, there's been a lot of chatter. I told you a little bit about Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson, and they had some talks. And one of the interesting things that I, when I listen to these talks is how often human sacrifice comes up in them. And, and I often think, why are we talking about human sacrifice? I can't think of any group in the world that is practicing human sacrifice. There's a little bit of animal sacrifice that goes on. I, I heard about a situation, I don't know if it was in Tibet or Nepal, where a plane broke down and the plane was stuck. And so the village priest came out and sacrificed a goat, and then the plane got going and, and everything went along. But human sacrifice is not something we hear too much about. Now, it, it comes up, and, and it used the chart years ago something like this. Christians believe in a primitive ancient God that demands human sacrifice. What kind of a God would ask for something like that? And it's a good point. It's, in fact, a really strong point, which is probably why they keep bringing it up. And one of the things, if you know a little bit of history, is you know that, that human sacrifice was, was quite ubiquitous throughout, actually, the history of the world all over the place. And it's, it's a strange thing. When the Spanish got to the Americas, the conquistadors were rather shocked at what they found. They, they, had these, they made these sketches and, and gave these dramatic accounts of the, the level of human sacrifice going on among, amongst the Aztecs. And the, the Europeans were shocked at this. And for a number of centuries, they assumed that these were exaggerations. Just recently, there was an article that they were doing some digging under Mexico City, and in fact, they discovered the accounts weren't exaggerated, that the Aztecs actually had this huge structure that was filled with skulls, and, and the skulls, just like they had in the picture, were, they put holes in them and lined them up. And so here they were, they discovered under the city just these, these structures here, which are just skulls formed into a tower. And we look at that and we say, my goodness, who would do such a thing? But Sam Harris has a point. And in fact, I decided, well, let me just do a little text search of the Heidelberg Catechism, our, more be our most beloved doctrinal statement in the Christian Reformed Church. And if you do a text search of sacrifice, it comes up all over the Heidelberg Catechism. In fact, it puts it at the very center of the Christian religion. But are both the word and the sacraments then intended to focus our faith on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross as the only ground of our salvation? It seems, in fact, the Reformers doubled down on it. Heidelberg Catechism and its, and especially the more breezy, newer translations, right I can, when I learned the Heidelberg Catechism from my father way back in Northside Chapel, I can just see him and hear him saying this, right, this is exactly right. And I could, if I were sitting with Sam Harris, I imagine he would say, right, <laughs> you Christians have this God that is appeased by sacrifice. Isn't that barbaric? If you look at human sacrifice, you begin to see that it is implicit in a lot in fact, animal sacrifice is really a substitute for human sacrifice. And if you say, read the beginning of the book of Leviticus, and you open it up and you see that if you see a family come forward to the altar with an animal, and the father places his hand on this animal, in a sense transmitting the sins to the animal, and the animal then goes on to the fire. And I worked this out in some of the other, vid in some of the other videos. Some of, some of the other sermons that I've given, how, how the fire represents God. Remember Moses and the burning bush. And in a sense, what the sacrifice means is we go on the altar into the presence of God. And because we are sinful, we are consumed. But remember what Moses saw in the desert. He saw a bush that was on fire. And you no, know, Moses spending a lot of time in the desert. You see a lot of burning bushes. But this bush was different because... In the bush, the bush was still there, and the fire was around it. And the bush was not being consumed. So, of course, Moses stops, 
And he gets closer, and then he hears a voice, take off your shoes, you're on holy ground. And then the story follows from there. But, but animal sacrifice is a substitute for human sacrifice. And even Torah observance with, if you remember, the temple gets destroyed in Jerusalem. And so the Jews can't offer their sacrifices at the temple anymore. They don't know what to do. So what they do and instead, when they go off to Babylon and to other places in the ancient world, is they sit around and they study the Bible. And that then becomes the substitute for sacrifice. And you, I bet you you never thought when you went to a Bible study or when you sat down for devotions that night and you had your little cup of coffee in the morning said, oh, I'm going to be inspired by reading the Bible. Well, there's a long chain that goes all the way back to human sacrifice and you're participating in it. And you think, well, that can't be right. And it gets doubled down in Christian churches because we not only follow the practice of Torah observance, which is what we're doing now with the sermon, but when we have communion, we say, here is the body and blood of our Lord given for you. Do this remembering him, remembering, putting him back together. Wow. What should we think of this? Well, we've been going through the book of Kings, and we're in 2 Kings. And if you remember the story, it starts out in Samuel, the, the tribes organize, and they decide they want a king. And so there's Saul, and then there's David, and David becomes, you know, the hoped for king, and then his son Solomon, who becomes the epitome. And, it, and what you have there in those first few chapters of the book of Kings is heaven on earth, in a sense, where Samuel, Solomon has all of this wisdom, and everyone enjoys this. But then Solomon is corrupted, and so what we've been, what we've been seeing are the stories of the downfalls of the king. And, and what we see is that this is a story of achievement and corruption, that what's true in the temple gets played out in the streets. And in fact, all of these stories over, over a long period of time, over hundreds of years, we find Israel being corrupted. Tiny motion by tiny decision by one thing to another, but it gets compressed in the book of Kings because they want us to see how this works. So in the 17th year of Pekah, son of Remaliah, Ahaz, son of Jothan, king of Judah, began to reign. Ahaz was 20 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 16 years. Unlike David, his father, he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord his God. And you remember that the book of Kings almost always gives us a little summary of the king, and then it boils it down to a binary, says good or bad. Well, here's a bad one. Well, why is he bad? He followed the ways of the kings of Israel and even sacrificed his son in the fire. And you begin to ask, why would a king of Judah sacrifice his son in the fire? Well, apparently this is what everyone did. Engaging in the detestable practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. In other words, this was ubiquitous. Everyone did this. Well, why would you do this? Well, because if you want to express something, well, why? Most of you women who are married, if you look on your left hand, you're going to see a ring. And what's sitting on that ring? A diamond. Oh, what's so important about a diamond? It's just carbon, right? But it's costly. Well, what does that mean? That, mean, that meant that that man had to sacrifice to express his love. And so this boils all the way back. And so the king needs a big favor from the God. And so shall I give a dove? Well, a dove is cheap. Shall I give a ram? Well, that's a little bit more. Shall I give an ox? Well, that's more. What's more precious than a son? In fact, if you go back in the book of Levites, you realize that the Levites, as a tribe set aside was only set aside in place of the firstborn. Why? Because the firstborn was first fruits. And again, when we hear all this stuff and we think, what on earth is going on? But we might pause for a minute and ask, why did everyone in the world believe this? I mean, even Aztecs, who 
are way, way far away, not in any communication at that point with people in Israel. He offered sacrifices and burnt incense at the high places, on the hilltops, and under every spreading tree. And what this says was Ahaz was very religious. And most of the time when we have a material problem, we look for a material solution. And if there's no material solution at hand, we look for a spiritual solution. And if you find that this starts working, well then you start looking for more and more spiritual solutions and you keep upping the ante. Ahaz was very religious. Then resident king of Aram and Pekah, son of Remaliah, king of Israel, marched up to fight against Jerusalem and besieged Ahaz, but they could not overpower him. Um, Pete, did you pick that psalm because it was the lectionary psalm or because you read the text? I, I, I noticed the parallels when I picked it up, but yeah, I knew it was the lectionary psalm. Pete usually picks the psalm from the lectionary, which right now isn't at all coordinated with the sermon, but we just had this psalm about these wonderful ramparts of, of Jerusalem, and here's Ahaz, the king of Jerusalem, and he's got no trust. He's scared for his life. At that time, Rezin, king of Aram, recovered Elah from Aram by driving out the people of Judah. And what this means is that Judah was on the retreat. They were getting beat on every side by Israel, by Aram. Edom was, was rising up. Edomites then moved into Elah and have lived there to this day. It has sent messengers to say that Tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria, I am your servant and vassal. Come up and save me out of the hand of the king of Aram and the king of Israel who is attacking me. And Ahaz took silver and gold found in the temple of the Lord and the treasuries of the royal palace and sent it as a gift to the king of Assyria. The king of Assyria complied by attacking Damascus and capturing it, and he deported its inhabitants to Ker and put Rezin to death. Now, Aram, Israel, Judah, these guys were small players. Assyria had an empire. And Assyria was ruthless. Assyria was so brutal, in fact, how they would conquer would be, they would conquer a city and what was standard throughout the ancient world for a long, long time. Once you beat a city, you'd say, well, here's the deal. We could kill you all, or you could be slaves. Which would we rather have? Actually, I'm not giving you a choice. I can get money out of here if you're slaves, so... That's usually what they did. But what Assyria would do is they'd go and they'd kill a city, they'd take the soldiers, put the dead heads on spikes, march up to the next city, put the spikes in front of them and say, any questions? And cities would just, they would just give up. They didn't stand a chance. And so Ahaz says, my only way out is not the Lord, it's the king of Assyria. So I'll bring him in. And he was only happy to come in. Then King Ahaz went to Damascus to meet Tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria, and he saw an altar in Damascus and sent it to Uriah, a priest, the priest, a sketch of the altar with detailed plans for its construction. So Uriah the priest built an altar in accordance with all the plans that King Ahaz had sent from Damascus and finished it before King Ahaz returned. Then the king came back from Damascus and saw the altar, and he approached it and presented offerings, offerings to it. He offered up his burnt offerings and grain offerings, pouring out his drink offerings, and splashed the blood of his fellowship offerings against the altar. As the bronze altar that stood before the Lord, he brought it from in front of the temple, from between the new altar and the temple of the Lord, and put it on the north side of the new altar. Let's say your husband goes to Vegas sees a show, comes back with a big poster of a showgirl that he saw there. Honey, I'm going to put your picture over here. I'm going to put this one up right here. How would that go over? No? No? You'd be a little upset by that? Can't imagine why. What is Ahaz doing? Well, Ahaz is not dumb. He understands, well, the God of Ahaz, or the God of Assyria, must be the big guy, Hadad. So take his altar and put that in Jerusalem. And, and maybe I'll be the good vassal of Assyria, and I'll ride his coattails all the way up. This is the way of the world, and it hasn't changed a bit. You kiss up, you kick down. This is how you survive. This is how you get ahead. 
Hierarchies develop and they corrupt. The strong take the weak. The wealthy and the powerful take advantage. It's my well-being at your expense. And any of us who don't understand that this is how the world works haven't been paying attention. I ran across this article in The New Scientist, Sinking the Titanic, Women and Children First Myth. Well, that's interesting. What naturally happens in a disaster, do you imagine, if a ship is going down? If your life is at risk, what do you do? You panic and you try to save yourself. And if someone is in the way, they're in the way. So this guy did a study of what happened on ships going down. The notion, women and children first, where does this come from? It appears to have started at the HMS Birkenhead, ran aground off South Africa in 1852. But the notion became widespread after sinking of the Titanic in 1912. The captain explicitly issued an order for women and children to be saved first. As a result, the survival weight for women was three times higher than men. How many of you have ever heard the phrase women and children first? It's about everybody. Do you think it's a good phrase? Okay, the women, okay. <laughs> Nina, don't laugh. You men, how many of you think it's a good phrase? <laughs> men are a little bit more reluctant, but <laughs> they're saying yes. And so basically, this didn't actually come from the Titanic. It came from another ship that sank a little bit beforehand. But obviously, somehow, it got into the mind of the captain, and it got into the culture, and it got into the people. In fact, it got so far into the culture and the people that it's in our culture. And I would dare bet that, well, the Titanic's pretty famous, but there are probably people around increasingly that don't know anything about the Titanic. This idea of chivalry at sea has gained mythical status. But you're the first person to examine if it's true for other maritime disasters. What did you find? We went through a list of 100 major maritime disasters spanning three centuries to see if we could find data on the survival rates of men and women. We ended up with the data on 18 shipwrecks, including 15,000 passengers. In contrast to the Titanic, we found that the survival rate for men is basically double that of women. And Marshall saying, yep, I know just what would happen. Those men would push those women out of the way and they would get in the lifeboat. Well, why would the men be so successful? Well, they're stronger. In contrast to the Titanic, we found that the survival rate for men is basically double that of women. We have only data on children for a limited number of shipwrecks, but it's evident that they have a really bad survival prospects, just 15%. In other words, it's a race between the men, the women, and the children, so who loses? Children. Isn't this way the world works? Now, who's on top of your hierarchy? Does it matter who's on top of your hierarchy? If Haydad is your god, then tiglath pileser will embody his values, and Ahaz will follow suit. We saw this last week with Baal and all this, all this, all this violence that Jehu started that the gods Hadad and Baal basically work, hey, it's pay for play. Remember Gray Davis? What's Gray Davis's call to fame in the state of California? He got what? Recall. Why did he get recall? Pay for play. Everybody kind of knew, well, you know, if you wanted Gray Davis's attention, first question out of his mouth, where were you when I was raising money for my campaign? I'm not going to put anybody here on the spot. I'm sure that never happens with any other politicians, right? Marshall's laughing again. What if that's how your God works? What if when you come to God with a request, you say, Lord, this is what I need. Let's imagine God talks back and he says, well, have you been to church lately? Have you been paying your tithe? Have you been sinning more than usual? Well, if you 
If you start performing better, then maybe I'll listen to your prayers. Now, I think most people think that's how God works because it's kind of in the church's best interest to talk that way. But is that how God works? Now, we might say, well, you know, when ships go down, we need a rational hierarchy. Maybe we can say women and children are weaker, so they might not survive anyway, so maybe we shouldn't prioritize women and children. Well, how about age? Maybe we should save 18 to 30-year-olds because they'd stand the best chance of, of living in a raft at sea, or maybe we should have people line up according to strength and fitness, or how about intelligence, or how about wealth? Why don't we save all the wealthy people and let all the poor people drown? Is women and, women and children a good criteria at all? But if I ask you this, you kind of say, yeah, that sounds kind of right. And when the, and when the captain says women and children first, now i got to comment because, you know, I, I give a rough draft of the sermons on Fridays. And, and so then I get comments from people, which are really helpful. And someone said, well, the women and children thing kind of worked on the upper level decks, but the lower level decks, things broke down. And it was mostly men that made their way in. But just recently, there was another ship that went down. And the captain quite famously got off early and fast. And the whole world seemed to be able to agree this was a bad thing. In fact, the, ca the captain basically got hauled into court. And I don't know, I think he probably did some jail time for this. And everybody says, yes, the captain should leave last. Why? Why do you think that? You think that because somewhere deep in your heart you believe that the good captain sacrifices himself for the sake of everybody else under him. That's your definition of good, of right, of how it should be. Now, one woman says, well, Captain Smith did this because he was trying to score political points. The Titanic has been so extensively studied and it confirmed the myth but there's little empirical evidence against this. That one scholar argues that the myth was spread by the British elite to prevent women's suffrage. And you think, so your boat's going down, and the boat that was supposed to sink, and you're really responsible, and you know you don't have enough life preservers for everyone, and you're a, you're a well-seasoned captain, and you imagine there's going to be huge loss of life, so you actually pass down the order to whatever discipline remains of your crew, and you say women and children first, and it actually, to one degree or another, gets fulfilled, but you're thinking, boy, I really want to keep women from the boat in England. You think that's what Captain Smith had on his mind? What's really amazing is that I don't think Jack and Rose had that on their minds. Or the movie maker when he made the movie. Because suddenly, a new generation, when they hear Titanic, this is what they think. And of course, Rose in the movie so famously says of Jack, he saved me in every way a person can be saved. And of course, the internet goes crazy. No, no, there's room for him on the door. You can get him on the door. It's not the point of the scene. Why is it the woman on the door and the dude who's going to freeze in the water? And all of you deep in your heart might think, I throw that woman off that. No, you don't say that. You might do it, but you don't say it. You think, I would sacrifice myself for my beloved because that is what love is. So why does the Bible retain stories of human sacrifice? Human sacrifice is the ultimate expression of how we try to save ourselves. Now, most of the time it's not this extreme, and most of the time it's not literal people being killed, and, and never hardly, you know, now it's not, you know, I'm going to build an altar and put you on it. But this is how the world works. We send drones over to far places in the world to kill terrorists, right? Because it's us or them. And we don't have any choice. It's emblematic of my well-being at your expense. We kiss up and kick down. 
Now, what's interesting about this passage in Kings is that there's another passage in Isaiah, and it's in Isaiah 7, a passage we often read during Advent, where actually Isaiah comes to King Ahaz, and it doesn't, Isaiah doesn't have all the dirt on Ahaz, and Uriah there later is given as a testimony, you think, how, how corrupt was Uriah? Because any priest worth his salt would have gotten that message from his king and told the king, you can take your drawing and whatever. Isaiah comes to King Ahaz and says, don't be afraid. God is going to save you. Ahaz doesn't believe it. And, and he says, a virgin will conceive and bear a son. And before that son can speak, the people that you are afraid of will be crushed. And Ahaz doesn't believe. And then Isaiah said, God will even give you a sign. He's begging for you to actually listen to him. And Ahaz, who we already know is very religious, gives some sanctimonious reason why, oh, I, no, no, I would never take a sign. But it's a sham. And everybody knows it. And so why should God be so generous to a king like this. Now, we may not like the Aztecs. We probably, when we think about the conquistadors, would probably be filled with the same self-righteousness they had. Now, the conquistadors are not anybody's, are not on the top of anybody's moral pyramid, because we all know what they did. But how do we sacrifice the needs of the young, the old, the weak, for our own advantage, and even for our mere convenience. Why does inconvenient child have any meaning in our world? How do we dispense with them for the advancement and improvement of our interests and status? What's interesting is that the location of this practice by King Ahaz you know, sometimes I'll joke with people, say, the word hell isn't in the Bible. And they'll be all upset and they'll grab their Bible and they'll open the New Testament and say, see, it says hell right there. I says, yeah, it says hell in English. But in Greek, there's two words in the New Testament that we translate into hell. One is Hades and one is Gehenna. We say, well, what's Gehenna? Well, Gehenna refers to actually a place outside of Jerusalem. And it refers to the place where the lights of King Ahaz would sacrifice their children for their own convenience. And Jesus looked around, and when he was telling parables about hell, he said, do you want to know what hell looks like? It looks like that. It looks like a father sacrificing his son for his own welfare. That's what hell is. But what about the sacrifice in church? Well, does the father... What does the father get out of his son's death in the Christian story? Isn't, this isn't Agamemnon getting fair winds. What does the son get out of his voluntary sacrifice? He stays on a cross and his political enemies are spinning on him, mocking him, saying he saved others, but he can't save himself. And what they get wrong is he saves others by not saving himself. And when we see it that way, suddenly, like the Roman soldier at the foot of the cross says, surely this man is the son of God. Well, why would a Roman talk like that? Well, they're putting stuff in the Roman soldier's ear, in the Roman soldier's mouth. Or maybe the Roman soldier saw something in that moment that made him stop. And it's the reverse of what all of us saw when the captain of the Concordia got off the ship quick with his crew. Maybe what he saw was more real than he expected. The immoral received the benefit. This voluntary offering transformed sacrifice itself from abuse to redemption. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing 
by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Now notice how obedient to death. It almost personifies death and saying, God, who by definition gives orders to death, now becomes death's victim. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Do you notice what just happened there? Jesus comes in at the top, goes to the bottom, Everyone kicks down on him, and because he does this, God brings him to the top again. Well, what does that say about Jesus? And what does that say about God? And what does that say we should be like? Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ. That's what baptism does. Baptism unites us in his, in his death and resurrection. And that's what Paul keeps teaching in his books. If any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one and of one mind, doing nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. But what does that mean if you're the captain of the Titanic? It means I'm only getting on a lifeboat if there's any room left for me. Otherwise, I will make sure the women and the children get priority. What does that mean in your job? What does that mean in your world? What does that mean in all the tiny little ways you negotiate your time in terms of who is important in this world? And you might say, well, why would Jesus come to an insignificant place and, and die in a way that there are no video cameras there? How on earth would anybody know this story? Well, look at it now. Everybody in the world knows this story. Well, why? Well, maybe something happened that King Ahaz, when he was sacrificing his son, couldn't figure out. And then we have to ask the question, well, do we believe this? Do we believe this is actually true? And if so, how will that change our lives? Let's pray. Lord, kiss up and kick down is built into us. It's natural and normal, and we live by it, and all of our structures in our world live by it. And you come into this world, and you turn it on its head, and you tell us that this is an abnormal rebellion compared to the regime of heaven. Lord, we don't know what to believe. We're all over the map and we're a mess. Help us, Lord, to pay attention. Help us, Lord, to listen. May we see this human sacrifice and may it change us from the inside out. Hear our prayer. In the name of Jesus, amen. Would you stand?